but you have now officially contributed to the Turing Way project live and you've broken the seal of getting involved and we're going to do more of it as we go on this session. Um, but that was, that was a, a sort of an exercise to show you that a lot of this stuff is quite complicated but when you break it down kind of conceptually into what you're doing on things like GitHub, you can just have discussions and collaborate with people and have some conversations and all that kind of thing. But again, a lot more, a lot of this stuff will become a bit clearer as we go into it. Um, so to give you uh, an introduction to what this session is going to look like, we're going to do a whistle stop introduction. And when you saw a longer session of this, this one is going to be a little bit more concise, a little bit quicker on what the Turing way is and what we stand for and how we use GitHub. Then um, a brief sort of conceptual introduction as to what GitHub's about, like why it's important, why it's useful for collaborative projects, all that kind of thing. And I'll hand over to Sophia and um, we'll go through uh, an exercise um, in learning about how to collaborate on GitHub and then contributing directly to the Turing Way project as well, and then come back for the next steps at the end. So firstly, introduction to the Turing Way. So the Turing Way is a project hosted at the Turing Institute. Important to say hosted there um, and not operating only there. It is an international project consisting, consisting of many volunteers across the globe, um, but it's just hosted at the Turing Institute and is an open source guide on data science. Um, so we involve and support a diverse community to make data science reproducible, ethical, collaborative, and inclusive for everyone. And the most important thing to say, oh, sorry, I've clicked ahead. Most important thing to say about the Turing Way is, so first and foremost, it is a book and an open resource online that anyone can access and use, but it's much more than just a book. It's a global community, as I mentioned, of people working on it, um, some paid and also a lot of volunteers coming together to share these kind of ethical, reproducible best practice and knowledge within the data science space. Um, it is an open source project. And as we'll see, that's hosted on GitHub and managed through GitHub for collaboration. And in a very wide, uh, wide level and wild scale, uh, wide scale, it is really focused on promoting this culture of collaboration in research and in sort of collaborative projects in general, and seeing how when we work openly and transparently together, we can achieve a lot more than just working independently. So in terms of what open source actually means, um, so open source has its roots in the free software movement of early, early to late 80s. Um, and the idea of free software was um, people could um, yeah, use software for um, download for free and get access to it to free. Um, but what was sort of realized almost immediately or straight away was that um, it would be important to not only have access to free software, but for a lot of people to be able to make their own amendments and make their own derivations of that software to use it for their own specific purposes. And so that's kind of where the open source movement started. Um, and this coalesced into the free and open source software movement, which sort of modified these licenses for modification and that kind of thing. And people realized just how useful that was and how important it was to be able to allow people to collaborate and, um, and modify and um, work with with software and whatever they wanted to and so it coalesced even further into saying okay not only derive your own works from pieces of software but actually collaborate from the ground up on open code bases that people, people can not only uh, modify together but literally build together as well and that influenced even wider open movements like open knowledge open data open access open science which are all built on this idea of transparency and also collaboration and building things together and we as the um, turing way see ourselves as like a primarily open knowledge and open science project and on the right there you can see a ton of amazing open source um projects and initiatives like the open source initiative cool so the turing way and its focus as i mentioned on collaboration and we also see that in collaborative projects, there's a, there's a lot of key practices that communities should be practicing when thinking about how to run a collaborative project effectively. So first and foremost, uh, again, with the book, it is developing and not necessarily foremost, actually. One of the main things is developing and sharing content. So with the Turing Way, it is a book that's made up of content that contributors are coming together from around the world and sharing expertise and putting it into the book. There's a lot more to, um, to collaborative projects than just creating content. Um, there's maintaining and improving what's already there to make sure that things stay up to date um, and any corrections are, and amendments are made, especially in something like data science and AI, where the landscape's changing the whole time as well, making sure that what resources are available are still relevant. Um, there's sharing resources as well. So above and beyond just creating content, um, not least, um, above and beyond just creating content, um, it's important to make sure that we're just sharing best practice and knowledge within the community as well to make sure we're driving the community forward in the right way. Um, reviewing and um, updating, so making sure, again, similar to maintenance and improving, but 
not just accepting any contributions from anywhere without thought as to whether they're appropriate for the book or appropriate for the community, um, but reviewing them and having sort of multiple eyes on the content um, and knowledge that we're sharing and creating to make sure it's aligned to what the community is trying to achieve. And a really big one for us is um, making it global and sharing best practices everywhere. So not making, not only um, making it available, say in English or just for people who are tech literate and all that kind of thing, um, but making sure projects are useful in any context and any place on earth, for any group of people that could find them useful. Um, and say a big part of the Turing way is we have a translation yeah. team that focus on translating the resource into multiple different languages. So it's not only focused on people who can speak English. For us, a lot of this stuff is really facilitated by using GitHub. So GitHub is a, we'll get into exactly what it is in a moment, um, but it's a really useful tool for collaborating with people across the world asynchronously in different time zones to achieve all of these different aspects of open and collaborative projects. And so the Turing way for us, we've chosen GitHub as our tool for facilitating the delivery of the project. The most important thing to say is we have chosen GitHub as a very useful tool for our collaboration. We are in no way saying that it is the tool that everyone has to or should or must use if you're working on a collaborative project. It is just the best tool for us and we'll be learning about why today. Cool. Any questions on that initial introduction? Sweet. So moving straight up onto the GitHub introduction, and I will race through this and I'm slightly behind time. Give me my two minutes. Um, so we'll just go over a sort of like a, concept, a conception introduction as to what GitHub is and why it can be useful for these collaborative projects. Um, so when you're working on um, collaborative projects or for us, um, collaborative documentation, there are a number of different challenges in um, doing so effectively. Uh, a big one is if you're working, as you said, with people across the globe and if you're prioritizing work, making it accessible to everyone, anyone, anywhere, um, you can be working asynchronously with people, so not working at the same time, but working independently at different times. Um, people might work on the same part of the work that you're doing and not realize that someone else is doing it as well. And so you can have conflicting edits to, to files that you're working on together, all that kind of thing. Um, time zones come into it, location comes into it. Um, and a big one is versions. So say we're all working on the same project together. I might be working on version one and making changes, but say Anne might be working on version two. And then suddenly, which we think we're working together on the same thing, we're doing something entirely separate, entirely different. Um, and it can be really hard to, if you don't have um, the right tools, it can be really hard to keep track of what versions everyone's working on, making sure everyone's working on the latest um, one and all that kind of thing. And so a solution to this issue of versions and asynchronous working um, is something called version control. Um, and version control effectively allows you to um, monitor and um, keep track of all the different versions of the product that you're working on. So for instance, if uh, version one is created and then someone makes some edits and creates version two, we have a central place where we're storing both version one and version two and then able to see what version one was when it was last edited, what the changes were that were made into version two and be able to access all the different parts of it. So we have this kind of like um, overview, high level view of what version we're working on and where the, all the previous ones are. We can also go in detail and look at each previous version and see what the changes and updates were and share that with the community and keep everyone up to date. So in terms of what this can look like um, and why you might have different versions, it can be for anything like adding new files to a project or adding um, new additions as they arise. It could also be removing different files um, or editing and amending them. This especially comes back to the sort of the maintenance point of as the context changes and as we learn new things, we might need to change what resources we make available for the community. And in a version controlled system, you can do all this stuff in a sort of um, timeline and structured way and see where all these edits, deletions, additions have happened. As I mentioned before, go back in time to any previous version and see what the changes were and potentially um, reinstate those versions and all that kind of thing. So where GitHub comes into all of this is, so the first part of that, Git, is a version control um, tool that you can use to keep copies of versions of a collaborative project you're working on. And GitHub is a platform that basically takes all the really messy work of looking at all this version control stuff and presents it in a really accessible and useful way. Um, so the way to think about it is a platform that visualizes all the version control you might want to do within a project. And so why we find it useful as a Turing way is that we have a ton of collaborators all over the place. 
So we've got a lot of version control to keep on top of and GitHub allows us to do it in a very, a very sort of like easy to access and, and visually useful way. Um, so for instance, this is an example of what um, a piece of collaboration might look like on GitHub. So say we're the dinosaur, which is on the left, this guy here. I, there was some contention as to what these animals were, so I, I'll highlight them as well. Um, the dinosaur over here has created a file in a collaborative project, so it has created, um, yeah, just say like a document um, that they've put onto GitHub as a file um, for the rest of the community to use. And different members of the community might see that this file has been added to the to GitHub and to the project, and might have different thoughts on it. So the squ squirrel, no fox, the fox or the squirrel might look at it and say, oh, actually, these parts of the file that was added um, aren't relevant or aren't quite accurate or aren't needed anymore. And so I'm going to remove them. And then similarly, um, at some point, at a similar time, the dinosaur might look at it and reread it and say, oh, actually, I put this in here, but there's a typo or I got that bit wrong. So I'm just going to amend that bit. Um, and then the, the, the blue bird down here might say, oh, that's really interesting. Now that this file has been created, we also need to create this additional guidance or this additional file to go with it, to pair with it. So the idea here is that once you do some work in a project, all the different collaborators and contributors might see different pieces of work that can be added to it to, to make it even better. And what you can do on GitHub is do all of these bits, as we mentioned, asynchronously, whenever it works for you, you can add them to the version control and just um, have that very clear timeline of all the different versions that were made, all the different edits that were made, um, and be able to see that all in one place and keep on top of it so that wherever these, um, these people are around the world, they can all see the latest developments and edits and additions and deletions that have happened on the project. So yeah, in terms of why GitHub's important and why you should use it, uh, or what, why, you should use, why you can use it for version control and projects, um, there's a number of different reasons. It's for it's a great place to host your projects online, so make it accessible to everyone. So on, on GitHub, projects are called repositories. So the Turing Way has a repository where all the information is stored and gives it ease of access to anyone anywhere across the world as well. Um, it's a really helpful way to work with contributors. So on GitHub, you'd have things called people called contributors, who is basically anyone who's working on the project with you. And again, because it's online, anyone can access it from every, anywhere. As I mentioned, it's a web interface for this really messy thing called version control, which we'll see in more detail in a minute, um, but provides a really easy to access useful web interface for looking at this stuff. Um, but also more than that, it allows you to look at things, uh, to do things like project management. So you can have project boards where you, as a team, list all the tasks that need doing and prioritize them and decide which ones to action and who's going to action all that kind of thing. And also, as I mentioned, like with the issues, you can have a place for discussions where you can comment and share thoughts and ideas as a community. So there's a lot more than just um, storing files that allows you to manage the entirety of your project as well. Um, and yeah, we, we, we find it useful for any project where a group of people are working together. It can also be useful just for your own projects um, if you want to have a nice, useful place to store version control and all the things associated with the project as well. Bits of a whistle stop tour. Realize that might be a little bit confusing as well. We are going to go into more detail as to exactly how version control and all this stuff works on GitHub with Sophia next. But are there any immediate questions? Oh, I see. Well, there's some in the chat. Oh, just yes. cool. Yeah, add as a caveat here that all of these slides will be available for you all to reference at any point. Um, and there are lots of resources that we'll be sharing here too, in order to make um, this process more clear. We are throwing all of these things at you as a reference, but you can always come back to it later on. So I'll pass it back to you. Yeah. And, and also a really good point um, with Bug Dash next week, there's a ton of people around to help with this stuff as well, who, who um, know quite a lot about it and quite familiar with it as well. So everyone's always here to, to help and answer questions if you have them. Um, but I will now pass over to Sophia to dive in a bit deeper into the version control on GitHub. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hari. Um, so as Hari kind of highlighted, GitHub is often used um, because of this powerful version control feature. But when we are collaborating on projects, whether that be the Turing Way or other open source projects, there are kind of some key tools um, that support you engaging in that. So what I'm going to go through is kind of outline each of those um, and then we'll dive in, do a demo and then we'll do something together. So 
these kind of tools for collaboration that that support this piece is um, using these things called issues, which we've already just done to discuss um, with collaborators to decide changes. Um, there is also the idea of repositories, which I like to think of as filing cabinets. Um, and if you don't own that specific project, that specific filing cabinet, you have to learn how to fork, fork it, create a copy of it so that you can work and make changes. And then obviously you're making changes. So we're writing, we're editing files. Um, and then what ultimately happens with those edited files is a pull request. And so these are kind of these four pieces that we're gonna go through. So with the issues, um, this is where the Turing Way and other projects um, provide a space to propose ideas um, for the Turing Way. It's a po po potential or possible content. Um, you can invite other people to have discussions um, and it means that different contributors will be able to see what is being worked on, they'll be able to offer help, they'll be able to share these thoughts and inside these issues um, you can have these really rich discussions that provide a lot of detail and invite further collaboration from others. The Turing Way is this massive expansive project that's been going for several years so the issues area can look a little overwhelming but that's actually where we're going to dive in today and as Hari said we've already done that first step, we've already started commenting and engaging in a discussion on an issue. So this next piece is what do files kind of look like? So you can upload almost any file type to GitHub, but when we're writing documents or writing something such as the Turing Way, which is a book, we do it in a language called Markdown. So Markdown is a simple kind of text markup language to quickly format text, as you can see, creating headings, using hashtags, creating bullet points, using asterisks or dashes. And this kind of markdown language is really useful for uh, blogs and kind of documentation. You can write academic papers in it. Um, and there's also a guide on Markdown's official documentation website about the syntax as when you first see Markdown, it can be occasionally um, overwhelming as that's what it looks like. Um, but once you wrap your head around it, it's just like writing in any other um, text editor such as Word doc, Google Docs or VS Code. So now let's talk about the vocab of GitHub is that as Hari mentioned, GitHub is this legacy of where um, software um, is built. And so a lot of the language of GitHub kind of comes from that software engineering world. Um, but once you kind of wrap your head around it, create these little analogies, it can be a lot more understandable. It is this legacy piece. So what would we be talking about is commits, branches and forks, which I mentioned, pull requests, and mergers. So a commit is essentially just hitting save. So uh, control S if you're on Windows, command F S if you're on a Mac. Um, it's saving a version of a file. Each time you make a change, you want to save it. You want to commit that into a document. And that is what a commit is. Branches and forks. I like to use the um, metaphor of a river. Um, so a branch it points to a certain part in the history where the main flow of information, the main part of the river, kind of you create an offshoot of it and you start working in a branch or you start working into a separate part where you can add a paper boat, you know, you can um, dam it up, you can do whatever you want to that specific part and it doesn't affect the main flow of information. So when you're making a work in progress, what you'll be doing is you'll be creating commits, saving commits to a branch and then what you'll go through is make a pull request. But as I mentioned earlier, if you don't own a project, you will need to create a fork and a branch is slightly different from a fork. So again, with branch, you've got a main river, a main flow of information that you're branching off, creating an offshoot, but a fork is an entirely different uh, copy. It's an independent version of that repository. So if you don't own the project, you will need to fork that repository, fork that filing cabinet, fork that information, um, work on that either in branches or in your independent version of the main part of information. And then you can continue either contributing back to that original version, or you can just spin out your own version, that own forked version of that content. So branches, same repository, there's one repository that you're creating offshoots on, whereas forking, you're creating a copy. 
So what happens when your little paper boat, um, you want to pull that back into the main flow of information or the works in progress that you've done, the commits you've made, the content you've created in these branches, you want to pull that into the main flow of information. Ideally, with the Turing way, you want to contribute it to the main book. So what you do is that through that process called a pull request, think of it as pulling the information from a branch into that main part of the information. And a pull request then turns into a merge. So the merge is when you actually commit and incorporate the changes from that pull request from that branch into that main flow of information. So pull request is just the request of can I add information to that main flow? And the merge is yes, we can. It's all now one flow of information again. So I will do um, a demonstration. Don't worry about um, needing to follow along or opening up another tab. We're going to talk through it first. I'll show you a little demo and then we'll go through to um, a little bit more hands on. So, do, 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 do. No, sorry, finding the right tab. I have too many screens and too many tabs open. So, what we're going to do is this is what the Turing Way repository looks like. Um, so when we open it up, we can see all of the different files that have been made. We can see a README, which tells us about the project. It's kind of like a quick start getting started guide. And I can see all the files. You can see up here that I can choose to fork the project and I can fork it. And now that's changed, so it says Brain on Silicon, the Turing Way, which means it's my independent copy of this repository. What I can do from here is I can then go into, um, for example, workshops. So right now we're giving a workshop. I notice that on here, we don't have our list of um, workshops today. So I can then edit the file, see that markdown come up, and I'm gonna write dash GitHub, And I can then edit this in my independent forked version of this repository where I can make changes. I will then choose to create a new branch because I might want to add some more information. I can see here that people have linked to the workshop files. So I'm going to want to come back to this later after this presentation and add the slides that we've worked on to this section. So what I'm going to say is added book dash and I'm going to say um, added November, so I can spell correctly, um, 2022 book dash GitHub workshop or workshop the more informative that I can write these messages, the more helpful it's going to be for collaborators to see what I'm working on. But also if I, instead of going there tomorrow and adding the information, if I forget about it and come back next week, I might not remember what I've done. So this, the more informative you can make these sections, the more it's like creating a lab notebook to yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put added book dash workshop. Hopefully it's all spelled correctly and I'll propose the changes. What that's doing is creating a fork. So if I then go again to this code section, I drop use the dot and you can see up there that there is a new fork that I've just created with my changes. And then when I want to add any more changes to that specific branch in my fork, I will then go check that I'm here and I can further edit it. So, Let's go back to slideshow mode. All right, so again, this is kind of how we work with projects that may be you independently, but how do we actually do this in a collaborative setting such as with the Turing Way? So we've talked about these ideas of issues. You've seen how we fork the Turing Way, how I edit a file, and then ultimately make a pull request. So with the Turing Way, there are these things called issues. So what we're gonna do is gonna find an issue to work on. Um, I already have a forked version of, of the project, but then we'll then edit a file based on what that issue is asking um, me to do and we'll submit a pull request. We'll ask for my changes that I'm suggesting um, to be merged into main. So 
let's let's do it. So if we go to back to the Turing Ways main repository, I want to now look for issues. What I can see is that there are a bunch of issues made um, that say good first issue, which I think it would be a really good idea to kind of work on. I want to find someone thing, something that I think will look really interesting. Um, you know what? I'm not quite as good doing this live. So let's just go to the issue that we have. Let's go to the workshop exercise list. There we go. So let's see a smaller subset of this information. What I want to work on is I want to add a cross reference. That seems really important. So I'm going to here, I'm going to see the issue. I'm going to read through it. So what it says is that we need to add a cross reference to the subchapter section of the book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment on the issue. Um, I'm then going to open up the link in a separate tab, visit the part of the repository, find line 26. I'm going to edit the file, use Markdown to add that part of information to that file. I'll check out what it looks like. And then what I'm going to do is save that or I'll make a commit to it. So let's get started. First of all, I have to say um, I am working on this issue so that other people who might be visiting this repository all around the world know that I'm working on it. They can either suggest um, kind of to help me out with this or they might not do it themselves if they know I'm working on it. So I'm working on this. I'm going to visit the repository in this part. I've got that open. It said find line 26, edit the file and add that information. So I'm going to copy that. And then going to go edit this file. So see that little pencil in the top corner, find line 26, confidential data. And then going to go paste, add that information. So that is now going to be referenced in the book. I'm going to scroll down and I see this option again to propose changes. So I'm going to say added reference um, to Confi data um, and I'm going to see that I can't commit to main because it's protected branch but I will create a new branch and say this is um, added cross ref added cross reference and I will propose the new changes that then create this new branch what the Turing way does is we put a lot of work into community building. And so we have a lot of templates. This template is then for a pull request, again, suggesting my changes to the owners of this repository. There's a lot of information here, but I'm gonna erase most of it because not all of it's super relevant. Summary, describe the program or the problem that we're trying to fix. I remember seeing that in the issue. So what I have to do is I have to then link this specific issue. So this issue's name is 2692. I'm going to copy that. Back in this pull request, it says that um, I added a cross-reference to confidential data section on line 26. This fixes. And I'll just check that that is tagged. 2692. There we go. Add a cross reference so I can see that that issue is now solved. List of changes proposed. And check that. I can erase that as that's what I've said above. Watch the reviewer concentrate their feedback on. Everything looks okay. And the second part about acknowledging contributors is that this is a really, really wide community. I'm already named as a contributor in the book. So what I will do is I will select contributors already um, as part of the community. However, many of you may be contributing to the Turing Way for the first time. So what you'll want to do is erase that and say that people should be added to the Turing Way. If you don't... Um, 
uh, tick that box it's okay we do have this tagged and we do have myself Hari and Anne on hand to help you out um, but for now I'm going to erase that and what I will do is click this big green button this is the most powerful button in github um, and what it's saying is I'm super happy with my commits I'm happy with what I've done so let's let's make a pull request can someone please review this pull request what I'll do is I'll ask Anne, who's here on the call, who is our wonderful community manager of the Turing Way, to review this information up in that top corner. And I will ask her, can you please review um, what I have done? Can you check that everything looks okay? And merge this pull request, merge the changes I have made into the book. So, a lot of information but to recap <laughs> what we're going to be doing is editing the book what you're about to do in a, in a moment is edit the book there is an issue and what you're going to do is read through the issue figure out what those changes are that it's asking you to do you're going to propose those changes edit the file then make that pull request add a little bit of information into the pull request remember to add the issue number that you're working on um, and anything information, for example, did you use the correct link? Are there any typos? I noticed a typo and I caught it. And then you're going to create that pull request, press that green button and merge it into the Turing way. So let's dive in. Um, how do we feel about breakout rooms, team? I think we don't have a super huge group. Um, I was people? thinking that. I did make two rooms um, uh -huh. where it could be maybe two people and then maybe they'll could each have a room each just to bring it even a little bit smaller. What do you all think? Yeah, two rooms. Hari can be in, a, in one. I'll be in the other. We'll be staying quiet and, and supporting you doing it. Still. I think also one thing to say just before we jump into the breakout rooms for you guys. So this historically has been a longer workshop we've gone into a lot more detail about some of this stuff. Now was a bit of a whistle stop tour. So it was a lot of information, but we are there to help. And please absolutely do not worry if it feels very confusing. <laughs> well, that was a lot of information um, because it is it is a lot and it's quite a short time frame. That's why we're here to help. Okay, so with that, I just made the two sets of breakout rooms. Um, you've just been divided into pairs, which folks are going into. Um, just a note is that uh, in case you get dropped off the call, they're also in the pad that was shared at the beginning of the call. But then with that, I think Sophia and Harry, maybe if you both go into each room, then we could kind of zoom through it. Um, should I keep it open maybe until the last five minutes? Okay. This is intense. <laughs> <laughs> it's very quick. It's too quick. Really it's not quick. Too quick. Yeah. It's um, nice. But I think uh, we just sit in there now and then we can. Yeah, if you, I think, go into group one, you should be good. Okay, great. Um, 